Hi there and welcome to another Ginger Prince production video. Um, today I'm going to talk about a post that I wrote that recently went up on the website uh, Debunking Christianity, which is John Loftus's website. He wrote Why I Became an Atheist, A Former Preacher Rejects Christianity and a number of other books. Um, and he kindly posted this, so I thought I'd share it with you and, and look at a couple of of the points that come out of it. Um, so is this the best possible world and does God have free will? So let's assume the triple characteristics of the classical approach to God, that he is omniscient, omnipotent and omnibenevolent. So in terms of the classic problem of evil, evil argument, if there is too much evil in the world, God knows what to do about it, he's powerful enough to do something about it, and is loving enough to want to do something about it. So this argument has been around since the days of Epicurus and still remains one of the most hotly debated theological issues in modern times, causing many believers to leave the fold due to its evidential power. However, logically, the theist can still defend their belief in God and the accusation that either God does not exist or God does not possess one, two or any of those properties. They do this more often than not by employing the ubiquitous God moves in mysterious ways or you cannot know the mind of God. What this equates to is the a priori claim that God does does have those three characteristics and that therefore all the pain and suffering in the world is not gratuitous but part of a grander plan and vision of an all-loving, all-loving and all-powerful super being. Although it's very difficult to logically disprove this defence, it does have some rather serious ramifications for the Christian theist. Because God is claimed as being all-loving, it means that any decision that God makes, any actualization of events and matter and so forth, must be the most loving that can be. It means that every decision made must be the most caring or loving decision that could possibly be made in terms of some criteria or some outcome. Since God is omniscient and given the possibility of middle knowledge or any other mechanism of divine foreknowledge, God knows every possible outcome for every actualization of every possible world, and God evidently chose this one. So first of all, the ramifications are fairly clear for God's own free will. Since he must do what is maximally loving at all times, he cannot do otherwise. One could argue then that God does not have free will himself. Without the ability to act contrary to his omnibenevolence, he has only one course of action that he can possibly take, or courses of action that contain equal quantities of lovingness, for want of a better term. A theist could argue that God could do otherwise, but chooses not to. This is akin to the taxman analogy, and this goes as follows. The free choice... Um, a taxman assesses your business. He says that you have a tax bill for $25,000. He gives you the choice of paying it or not paying it. The free choice is yours. However, by not paying it, you will go to prison. Or to make the analogy more powerful, you will be sentenced to death. Thus, you have a free choice where you can exercise your free will. But one choice will result in your imminent imprisonment or death. What will it be? You can argue, perhaps, that you have free will. But you can also argue that it is an effective denial of free will. In the same way, God could choose in a way that was not maximally loving, but he never would because it is against his all-loving nature. This is a grey area of free will. This is a debate here. Uh, there is a debate here as to whether God does not have omnipotence or whether omnipotence can be a potentiality. If it's a potentiality that can never be made real or existent, then this does not equate. Then does this not equate to it not existing at all? And I think that's a really important point. And actually, it makes me think of, of when people say that humans have free will, and, and theists will argue that we have free will, um, but surely we're just acting within our nature. And the reason why we choose X, Y, and Z is because it's our nature. Um, and that's what makes us act as, as we do. And if we're never going to choose otherwise, then and our nature defines and dictates what we say, then that is a denial of free will in exactly the same way it's a denial of God's free will. However, the main point to be made here is as follows. It seems then that if God is to keep his omnibenevolent characteristic, then this must be the maximally perfect and loving world that there can be. If God is perfect, then this must be his most perfect creation. 
A perfect God could not create something that fell short of perfection, and an all-loving God did not create some, could not create something that did not fulfil the criterion of being the most loving creation. The slightly worrying outcome of this is that a world where 250,000 people and millions of animals are killed in a tsunami is this world. You know, where anywhere between 20 and 75% of all fetuses are naturally aborted, depending on what source you, you read. Where cancer and malaria are rife, where a global flood killed all the population of Earth, bar 8, and all the animals, bar some. Where forest fires kill baby deer. It's a world where these events that are perhaps even necessary for it to be the most loving world. And that's, to me, that's fairly disturbing. Moreover, the Westboro Baptist Church, which you may have heard of, very famous for causing all sorts of uproar, may have some kind of twisted logic in celebrating the death of every soldier, in celebrating the outcome of pretty much anything as being the righteous judgment of an all-loving God. They stand at the roadside when soldiers come back in coffins and cheer because that's evidently what God wants. And, you know, they've got a point in, in some weird and one, wonderful way. Uh, they realise that this judgement by God to actualise this particular world must be supremely wise and must result in the most loving world. This includes every piece of suffering and death experienced by every animal and plant in the history of the world. So, this leaves us with um, the conclusion this is the best possible world and that God has created it and there's a, I, I think a quite a clear logical argument that shows this and it goes something like this premise one God is perfect premise two a perfect being cannot create imperfectly conclusion this universe is a perfect creation it then follows the next argument, premise one, this is a perfect universe. Premise two, we have tsunamis, malaria, cancer, death, pain and suffering of very many shades. Premise three, these things exist in a perfect world. Conclusion, these things must be necessary for a perfect world. So I wonder if you agree with that argument. The only uh, area of debate I would say is that, that God has possibly not created every minute bit of pain and suffering explicitly, but he's created the parameters in which those things can exist, and he knows that they will exist, and he still doesn't create otherwise. So therefore, he must know even if he doesn't, if he leaves things to say, you've got the free will defence, where where people say, well, these things come about because of our own free will, and he's created the world with our free will, and it's our fault that these things have happened. That doesn't explain tsunamis and things like that, which is why I, I particularly talk about tsunamis and cancer and malaria. But there's a certain amount of, of pain and suffering that that can come from humans, but he's just created the parameters, and it, it's we that have taken that that pain and suffering on as our responsibility however as I mentioned this doesn't answer the plate tectonics tsunamis earthquakes malaria cancer all the stuff that we don't have control over as human beings and God has created the parameters of the universe which allow for that uh, and or for these things and all the pain and suffering that result from that must therefore be a necessary part of a perfect world because otherwise God would clearly have created a universe where those parameters don't create plate tectonics where he would create a universe where plate tectonics don't exist because it would be a more loving and better creation than, than this universe obviously he can't do that um, because it doesn't lead to a more loving universe therefore you know this universe must be the most loving and it has to include things like tsunamis and malaria 
and there therein lies your issue with God and being all loving and all powerful and all knowing you know this is the problem of evil it, it, this must be the most perfect world and all the pain and suffering must be necessary for it to be perfect so anyway just to finish off um, my final concluding remarks um, would be pretty much what I've sort of said if this is where logic takes a Christian then they can keep their God in all his maximal perfection and while they're at it they can package up all the pain and suffering and send it return post to the purdy gates not needed here thanks Anyway, thanks for watching, and if you haven't already, please do take a look at, buy on Kindle, in real paperback, book format, the little book of unholy questions by myself. Um, it poses 501 thought-provoking questions that I'd like God to answer, so they're posed directly to God, with um, uh, good introductions to each section to explain all the different um, topics. Uh, fantastic book, got um, lots of good reviews, uh, so please go forth and buy my book and help me out a little bit. Cheers, take care.